The late Cretaceous in North America is a golden age for ceratopsians. Many of these horned herbivores have spread across the continent in vast herds, but one of the most common doesn't have horns at all. Pachyrhinosaurus still have a neck frill, but instead of horns, they have developed thick nasal bosses over their snouts, which males use in tests of strength during the mating season. These two-ton herbivores are built for trudging through the thick snow during the frigid winters, but in summer is when they are most busy. Working their way through the forest eating as much as they can, building up for the harsh winter ahead. This herd has over 60 members, with the large adults leading everyone to the best feeding grounds and acting as protection against predators. Amongst the 5 meter adults are various youngsters, the smallest hatch during the spring and have a lot of growing to do. In only two years, they will be half the size of the adults. Some of the sub-adults find time to play in between the endless eating and moving, with the young males testing their strength against one another, mimicking what they see the adult males do during the breeding season. The herd is often accompanied by the occasional Edmontonia. These heavily armed nodosaurs do not form herds but will freely mingle amongst other herbivores. This is for mutual protection, but also because each of their senses complement each other. Edmontonia have a better sense of smell, while the Pachyrhinosaurus have better eyesight and are taller than the shorter nodosaur, giving them a better field of view. They all have to be on high alert, since the confined forest hides many predators, including the most dangerous of them all, Albertosaurus, and one is watching the herd. At 9 meters long, she is fully capable of taking on a full-grown Pachyrhinosaurus, but it would still be a huge challenge. The herd actually spotted her half an hour ago, but they haven't fled. Instead, they make sure at least one of them knows where she is at all times, whilst the rest of them continue to graze. If they run, they would not only expose their rears to being attacked, but they would also lose the benefit of having the armored tank that is the Edmontonia in their midst. The nodosaur acts as an impregnable wall that the predator would have to get through in order to attack the herd, and even then she would face the dozens of armoured skulls that would block her path. The Albertosaurus much prefers to hunt during the winter months when she can use the low light to ambush her prey. She can see no obvious weakness in the herd, and disappears into the forest. The herd calms down slightly, but there are other predators that are far harder to see. On the top of a fallen tree are a pair of Sauronophilestes. At less than two meters long, they are no threat to the adults. However, they could make off of a hatchling if they were brave enough or foolish enough to try it. Even the yearlings are too large for them to attack, and though on occasion hatchlings will become unsupervised, the majority of the time they are surrounded by the adults. For the small carnivores, there are plenty of easier targets elsewhere in the forest. The Pachyrhinosaurus have successfully eaten all they can in this section of the forest and move onwards. In the middle of summer, they enjoy 24 hours of sunlight, so the plant life can continually grow. But this will all change once autumn begins to slowly plunge their world back into night. So for now, the herbivores eat and eat. The adults with their large bodies are well suited to the cold that is to come, but the younger members are hit harder. In fact, though most of the hatchlings will make it to winter, many don't survive the harsh snow and freezing temperatures. Less than half of them will see their second spring. Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down one of the more unique ceratopsians, Pachyrhinosaurus. Pachyrhinosaurus was originally discovered in the mid-1940s and named in 1950. These original finds were made in the Horseshoe Canyon Formation in Alberta, with additional finds made in the St. Mary River Formation. A large bone bed was discovered along the Pipestone Creek, which contained over 3,500 bones of Pachyrhinosaurus, including 14 skulls. This was the site of a mass mortality, likely from the herd drowning in a river, and contains many individuals of all ages. 
Pachyrhinosaurus is a genus that lived between 74 and 68 million years ago in the late Cretaceous, and is split into three species that lived at different times. The oldest, Lacustae, lived between 74 and 72 million years ago. The second, Canadaensis, lived between 71 and 70 million years ago. And the youngest, Paratorum, lived between 69 and 68 million years ago. These three species means that Pachyrhinosaurus is the most species-rich genera of all ceratopsians. Canadaensis was the largest, growing between 6 and 8 meters long, and weighing between 3 and 3.3 tons. The other two were around the same size, getting up to 5 meters long and weighing between 2 and 2.2 tons. But other than size, what were the differences between them? Well, all of them have the signature armoured boss over their snouts made of hard keratin. They also had two smaller bosses over their eyes in place of horns. Then, like other ceratopsians, they had a large shield-like frill extending from the back of their skulls. In Lacustae, the gap between their eye bosses were quite wide, while the other two species only had a small gap between them. In Canadaensis and Lacustae, both have two small, backwards-facing horns on top of the thrill. Also in Lacustae and Peritorum, have a jagged, comb-like extension at the tip of their boss. The use of the nasal boss and the head frill was for displaying to potential mates first and foremost, and used as a deterrent against rivals and predators secondarily. The boss may also have been an effective tool for toppling small trees and other plants in order to access food. Like other ceratopsians, Pachyrhinosaurus had a powerful beak used for shearing off tough plant matter, and strong cheek teeth that allowed them to grind down their food before swallowing it. Because of the wealth of fossils from all different age groups, scientists have learned a lot about Pachyrhinosaurus' growth throughout its life. In their first year, they grew up to 28% their full size, and by their second year, they were 50% the size of the adults. But after that, their growth slowed down. They wouldn't reach their full size until they were around 20 years old. The growth of characteristics used in sexual selection, such as a pronounced nasal boss, appears around 9 years old, or when they were around 75% their max size. This may also be when they reach sexual maturity, but isn't fully known. For those that lived in more northern regions, their growth rate slows or even stops during the winter. North America was further north than it is today, and likely had very harsh winter periods, so Pachyrhinosaurus would stop growing in order to conserve energy and make it through the harshest time of the year. So, Pachyrhinosaurus, another tough and powerful ceratopsian, built to tackle some of the most extreme environments the late Cretaceous had to offer. It was obviously quite numerous and successful, yet the general public doesn't seem to know about it. However, I do know that this species does have a hardcore fan base, and I am one of them. The development of bosses in place of horns is quite unique. That, along with the multiple species and incredible crest ornaments, has made it my new favourite ceratopsian. But what do you think of Pachyrhinosaurus? Would you go with the traditional horns, or a boss for offensive means? What lesser known dinosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.